Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the Kodiak Shack podcast. Today, I have Stuart Wagner, uh, who is doing a lot of really exciting stuff in the uh, defense innovation uh, space. We'll let him talk to it. Uh, but Stuart, thank you for being here today. And uh, go ahead and tell us about yourself. Hey, Vader. I'm Stuart Wagner, Chief Digital Transformation Officer for the Department of Air Force, uh, originally from Michigan, uh, was briefly in the Army. Um, and then, and then spent uh, some time as a software developer, uh, before returning to the department of defense and now the department of air force. So excited to be on the show and appreciate you having me excited for the conversation. Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to it. So, uh, we talked before we started recording that I have friends that are super excited, uh, the stuff you're doing, uh, with the hackathons, which we'll get into, um, and just, just kind of how you're shaking things up. So that's really cool. And, uh, we all appreciate it as the, uh, as the end users, uh, there. So can you kind of dig into being the chief digital transformation, uh, officer there? Like what that means, what that entails, uh, on a day to day, week to week, month to month kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, so, so if you look up like digital transformation, if you like Google it, um, you tend to find it like basically refers to like buying computers or buying technology or using technology better in some way. Um, there's not really an obvious or clear definition of digital transformation and the word actually doesn't even really exist. Um, at least in the tech circles I ran in with friends who were software developers, um, this seems to be largely a marketing term, to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> it seems to have penetrated deeply into uh, the Department of Defense. If you look at like different organizations within it, many of them have a digital transformation strategy. The Air Force at some point may have a digital transformation strategy. But what it, what I take it to mean there are two words. And so as I kind of like try to reduce it, what does that mean? Digital transformation. What I think of is digital is bits, right? It's uh, binary bits or qubits. It's bits that are recorded somewhere. And then transformation kind of is cultural. So I think of digital transformation being ultimately the automatic collection of data to inform on human and machine process, right? So anything that records a process in time if, if, if I can, if, if it records it in a digital fashion, then we can learn from that and improve basically our decision making, which may result in some sort of cultural transformation or change within the organization. And ideally, you're increasingly instrumenting, uh, automatically collecting and analyzing those data in a loop, which allows for better decision making. And so I don't see digital transformation being too much different, perhaps the digital piece being the different part to say an OODA loop. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. So th one of the questions I, or one of the things I always complain about is the, it seems like the Air Force captures all kinds of data, flying data, training data, network data. So what are they doing with that currently? And what could they be doing with it? Uh, maybe better if they're not optimizing that data. Yeah, no, it's a great question. So my first question when I got to the Air Force was, where is those data? And and I started in a surprisingly different place than others, at least within my organization. So I worked for the CIO of the Air Force. And what I would have expected was like, so the primary mission of the Air Force is, uh, you probably know better than I do, but but I would suspect mm -hmm. it's like to dominate, you know, the air, um, yeah. to dominate fighting from the air, to, to shoot at other things in the air, to shoot at things on the ground, to make people not want to shoot at you, right? Those would be perhaps some of the primary missions of, of the Department of Air Force, right? And now with Space yeah. Force, also in space, right? To dominate space as well. Um, I like all those things. Right, right. I would think you would. <laughs> and, and given your background as a pilot. And so, so I would have expected those data to be top of mind in our organization. But when I joined, it wasn't, right? The the, yeah. the thing that's top of mind within our organization, notably also important in enabling many of those things is like say enterprise IT or IT systems, the ability to send emails, networks, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, when I joined, I wanted to like refocus or at least add focus to the CIO's office 
to weapon system data. It struck me that nobody knew where it was. Nobody knew like where it was being aggregated. Nobody knew how to aggregate it. And, um, and therefore, if, if that's the case, then likely we weren't driving outcomes from our data. And that seemed like shocking to me, given that <laughs> it's the primary mission of the Air Force. So like, how did, how did, how did weapon systems miss, miss the data revolution, right? I think there's a few causes for that. The primary one being our decentralized approach to both information sharing and aggregation, the aggregation of data and also um, acquisitions and investments into our systems. And so we've decentralized that process. So like it's weapon system by weapon system. I would say exquisite weapon system by exquisite weapon system. And so um, everything's, everything's being built to replace the other thing, right? Um, yeah. we're going to build the new thing that's going to be better than everything else. And you won't need everything else. And it never ends up that way. There's a long yeah. tail to the investments we make, right. To the data we're collecting. And, and for whatever reason, um, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to have a unified force behind it, like a unified concept. GIC2 is supposed to bring that, I think, um, and, and, and simultaneously seek to connect these systems. And so anyways, um, that's, that, that was the context under which I, I entered the organization. And that is, that is one of the primary things I think about and work on, uh, at the air force today. Well, and I think that's sadly, it, it doesn't surprise me. You know, I, you would think I, I would be surprised by some of the, these things, but working in the air force for 11 years, I didn't. I mean, again, a lot of these people in these leadership roles, they're, they're, driven people. They're very dedicated people that they've dedicated their lives to, to get there, but they're, they're not you. They don't have your perspective. They're people like me who it's like, Hey, I, I flew airplanes and now I do other stuff. And, and so we don't even understand the, the wealth of knowledge that is available in that data. And even more importantly, how much we're losing by not exploring that data more deeply. So when you uh, so is, was this kind of the impetus that drove the hackathons creation? Is that what's, what happened there? Yeah. So I, I, what, why, why did we run a hack? So there's actually a few reasons why, um, yeah. I would start with, so we are a policy shop. We don't have extensive funding and the solution to this problem is extraordinarily expensive. It's both time expensive and money expensive, right? And so the thought was like, there have been all sorts of efforts that that have been undertaken within like the CD, now the CDAO's office to fix this. Like there's been many people who've tried to create the database that will rule all the other databases. The, the, the data infrastructure that everything, like the replacement to everything, it's, it doesn't just happen in weapon systems, it happens in, in data architectures at all as, as well. And, and, um, we didn't want to do that. The thought was, um, the thought was, could we, could we just use the stuff that exists in an environment that allows you to connect it? And so I met, um, Dr. Rev Jones, um, Rev is a former test pilot, also, uh, F-16, um, test yes. pilot and test pilot instructor runs a program, ran a program at the time, now at the Air Force, but was at DARPA called Stitches, which is a systems of systems integration tool chain that seeks to connect weapon systems and action them. Um, and not just weapon systems, any really IT system to allow them to basically communicate and action, even though they weren't designed to do so. So it's kind of like um, a, a, some pretty sophisticated middleware that, 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 that enables them to communicate and, and execute. Um, and they had been running these events for actually like four years at DARPA. What they would do, it's so interesting. They would, they would go, okay, we've got these like 10 weapon systems. They've now connected, I think over 200 weapon systems, but they, they'd go, we've got these 10 systems we want to connect. And these are like classified systems. They might even be at higher levels of class. They're likely at higher levels of classification than like secret. Right. And, yeah. and, and they're like, in two weeks, we're going to connect them all. Right. And so what they would do, they didn't have the space. This is such an interesting thing, um, in, in DOD, 
it, we don't have a lot of classified space, special highly classified space. So they needed to create like temporary classified space. So they would do that and they could get the approvals to do that. And they would like, they would need to go to the location where those systems are at. So they would create a temporary ATO or a temporary uh, ATO as authority to operate, IATT, an interim authority to test uh, IATT. And so they would create basically a temporary authorization within a temporary skiff with these weapons data. And so they would like, I mean, they would do crazy stuff like they would get a trailer authorized to go up pretty high. And then what they would yeah. do is take these weapon systems, these data and these systems themselves, bring them into the room and, and start connecting them and making them work. And, and they couldn't actually, because, because it wasn't cleared to hold that information permanently, they actually couldn't like leave and close the door <laughs> and just come back the next morning. So they would just, instead of, instead of, you know, cause they would need to take the whole thing down every time they couldn't do that. So instead what they would do is they would just leave it up and they would just have a person babysit this thing. And so the thing would run 24 hours for like, you know, 24 hours a day for like two weeks, which meant they had to have manpower to man all of this. They would do all of this work to bring up this environment so that they could connect weapon system data together and weapon systems together. And they were really successful at it. And they, they did this for like four years to prove the software out. And so when I met Rev, we started talking about the weapon system data and the access to it and the ability and, and many of the problems we just discussed. And, and he basically edu he had answers to questions. Where is the F-16 data? I know where it is. It's right here, right? How is it being left? It's not, right? Like, yeah. you know, and so what we, what, what I posed to him is I said, Hey, what if we ran like a hackathon with like weapon system data? And what I didn't realize when I asked him that question is that he had been effectively running land parties with weapon systems data at highly classified levels for like four years. And so the only difference between what he'd been doing and what I proposed was the inclusion of everybody else. And so yeah. that's, that, that was the genesis of this, right? And why, why, why do a hackathon? Well, it's kind of interesting. If we can create a, I, a, a, I wouldn't say we're ideal, but I think we're closer to ideal than many other spaces. If we can approach ideal for one week, we can scale that in the future, right? But we need to prove that we could even get there for a week. And so the thought on the hackathon is, could we solve a lot of these data problems and weapon system problems in a week? Could we actually demonstrate that, that we can produce that environment, bring it up for a week and then tear it down? Why tear it down? Well, when you tear it down, you create demand. Everybody goes back to what they were working with and it doesn't exist there, right? And so the fact that it doesn't exist, that can incentivize potentially organizations to go, wait, 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 wait. we need this to stay. Um, and yeah. so, and so actually, um, we've now found in multiple locations at our events, the organizations go, we need this back now. Like we're going to have to pay, we're, we'll pay to bring this back, but we need a proper development environment where people can build stuff. Um, because, because this needs to happen all the time. Um, I don't know if I jumped ahead or anything, but that's, that's, uh, hopefully that answers your question. No, that's great. And I think there's there's so many limitations that people don't understand. Like when we say data isn't used, it's, it's not even the fact that it's not used. It's the fact that like, again, I'm not a computer science guy. So please speak up when, when I say incorrect things. But what I've been told is like the, the original code that the F-16 was written in, people don't even write in anymore. You know, so it's like, I, I struggle to find people to even rewrite the old code. So now we're talking, new code from new fighters, old code from old fighters, and they all somehow have to work together in a classified space, spanning classifications, spanning geography at sometimes. And how are we going to do all those things? So it's, it is a huge problem set because we, it wasn't at the outset. It didn't start where, Hey, we're going to integrate all these things. It was, Hey, these are all stovepiped. And now bringing them together later has to just be a nightmare. Um, so that's awesome that 
that Rev was doing that. And then you have created these hackathons. So uh, kind of jumping into the hackathons, can you kind of explain it for the lay person so they don't, you know, so they understand what's actually happening happening in a hackathon and then how many you've had and kind of the success, successes that have come out of those? Yeah. It's kind of like a giant land party, but with weapon system data at a classified level. That's that's what yeah, a hackathon. I, that's what a hackathon see, is. And yeah. I think even a, a land party. I think as a person, I was a geography major, so you you I, might I, have to water it down I'll, a bit. I'll, okay. So <laughs> what we do is we create a separate network uh, today. In the future, uh, we think we think it'll be in the cloud. But today, we create an isolated network. And the reason we do that is because that severely reduces risk. Um, so risk is, 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 is very important within the Department of Defense. Risk yeah. entails, you know, getting shot at. Risk entails, you know, um, nuclear blasts. R risk also entails vulnerability of software or access to data. And so what we needed to do was, was, was create comfort for authorization officials, which authorize that environment. Um, that that the data will not leak. Uh, that the that the software we use uh, won't produce vulnerabilities within the production environment. So we just created a separate environment. Um, and so in order to do that, we we you know from our start we air gapped. So we create our own network. We run our own network cables. You show up to an event, and it's just basically a bunch of laptops networked together. Um, at our first event, there were there were MIGs at the event, and they were running network and power cables off the wings of the MIG, duct taping them, taping them on. It really is a, a improvised event. Um, it's it's entire. It's a temporary. It's a temporary environment, and so um, and so what 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 do you do at a hackathon with a with a with basically these network systems and this access to data? Well, whatever you want. That that that's the way we've approached it. And so, um, in short, you show up for the week. Uh, we have some ideas of what problems you can you 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 can you know that are sponsored that that certain organizations say we would really like you to solve them, but we don't make you go do them. Uh, you can pick the problem you want to do, or you can bring your own problem to the event. So if you discover something that you think has been underrepresented, you can just go work on it. And uh, we don't tell you when to work. We don't tell you who to work with. Uh, we do encourage you to join a team or to participate in a team, but we don't we don't determine anything for you. So you pick your problem. You pick when you work. We're open 24 hours a day because we're dealing with classified data. We can't shut it down. So we actually just keep it open. So yeah. you pick whatever you want to do. And then what we do is we bring in senior leaders to go look at that event. And so this has been totally a different experience for senior leaders as well because they're like, what am I going to see? And they'll be asking that months before the event. And I... I, I go, I don't know, because they haven't started <laughs> building it yet. They're they're yeah. going to figure, and they're like, well, when will you know? And I, I, we'll probably have an idea on the third day of the event, right? <laughs> you <Yeah>. know? So, <laughs> um, but that's the nature of the hackathon. And, 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 and the idea is we want to build emergent capability with these data. And, and perhaps in the future, move to actually data-centric exercises and operations. That's That's where I think we actually go to next um is more than just software or the collection of data from 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 you know something recorded in the past but could we record something immediately and leverage it and so that might be where we go next um does that kind of provide a description of what a hackathon is yeah it does and i think the it's it's so it's so fitting because again yeah as you experience probably at work and and i experienced in the past is you you have to know what your, you know, our DLO, our desired learning objective. So I have to know that beforehand because I can't just do stuff and let things happen. Uh, so it's, it, it, it probably is the reality of, Hey, they, it's an organization that, that wants very measurable metrics and they don't want to do things just to see what happens. Uh, and then a hackathon is exact opposite. It's like, Hey, kind of let things bloom and, and, just be created and and don't close down or or limit the about the things that people can do in there because of the restrictions you put on it. So uh, you talked about air gap and everything. So when when you're talking about working with classified stuff, 
I assume everybody gets a little nervous, you know, they're very much like, oh no, here we go. This could, this could be dangerous. Like you said, data spillage and, and exploitation. Uh, so besides just air gaps, do you think as an organization, like the DOD does good or bad with their kind of classifying and controlling of data or is it, is it too much? Is it too conservative? Yeah. Um, my opinion is that classification is institutionalized anti-collaboration policy. <laughs> um, it, it is, it is, it is written, agreed to policy that inhibits collaboration with work product. And it's designed to do that, that, that it, like they don't, say that but that's the point of it think about why would they go ahead why would they want that why would they want to inhibit collaboration like why would that be the end state collaboration is risk that's the truth collaboration is risk sharing information is risk if i can't tell you about what i'm working on there's no way you can collaborate with me that's (laughs) that's that is that is impossible i (laughs) I can't, I, if I can't even give you a demand signal about what I need, you can't collaborate. If I can't walk you through my problem or use case, you can't collaborate. If I can't share my data, you can't discover something new to leverage. Like what is collaboration? I think there, like collaboration is two things. Um, in tech, it's commonly assessed as the evangelization of one's work, one's individual contributions or the leverage of somebody else's work. Either I produce work and you use it, or you produce work and I use it, right? Or or there's some jointness or mixture between those two concepts. But that is what collaboration is. I produce work and you use it, you produce work and I use it, or a combination thereof. We do it together. But if I cannot share information relevant to my work, you can't collaborate. It's impossible. Yeah. But JADC2 and ABMS demand collaboration. Yeah. Uh, and prim- how, like how these are, are these are primary missions of the Department <laughs> of Defense, and we've written policy that prevents it. The one thing, sadly, it, it almost seems like a universal. I mean, I, obviously, you, you kind of have a slightly different Air Force experience yeah. uh, in your shop, but have you seen just kind of bases and how bases – collaborate and interact and work well together between comm, finance, operations, maintenance. Have you, have you experienced that? Not, not, um, not closely. I was briefly in the army, but, but not, not, not as much as I would like. Yeah. So the, uh, it's the exact same. It's the exact same. It is no collaboration happens. Ops doesn't know the constraints and the limitations that finance is under the, and finance doesn't know the constraints and limitations that ops is under. So nobody is understanding of each other's plight when they say like, we're undermanned, we're overworked, we can't get everything done. Uh, so it's, it's, again, it's like, a, it's across the board. It's not only with data and collaboration, it's with just humans. It's, it's the people in the organizations don't even understand what the other people are dealing with or working with uh, to be more understanding and to be more supportive. Uh, Cause I think it's the same. They both are going to benefit by having exposure to the other people's experience. Just as with data, both people do better with the other people's data experience. Uh, so you've had, do you have another hackathon coming up? So, so I'll, I'll, I'll respond really quick to that though. Okay. Yeah, go I ahead. Do think, I do think there's a little difference between the challenges with working across classified information and say the the disconnect between say ops and age uh, ops and finance. So notably, classification would play a role. They go, ah, I can't share this thing with you, finance, yeah. you know, or whatever, or vice versa, right? Um, but but the 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 human problem I think is not just classification; it's incentives. So uh, incentives and mal incentives. So um, ensure people like organizations that have a specific mission are not inclined to work on other mission. Why would they do that? That's not their mission. They're not assessed by that mission, by that other mission. Uh, their contributions may not even be 
uh, noted or, or there may not even be awareness from senior leaders. So actually there's a male incentive. If I spend my time working on something else other than my, the primary mission of my organization, um, that means I'm not working on the primary mission of my organization, which means it may actually hurt my performance, right? Uh, and my future career opportunities. So what is the incentive to work, you know, on somebody else's mission or to contribute to somebody else's mission, even if it could produce a large return on investment? And I don't think the Department of Defense has nailed that yet. Um, I, 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 I don't think they have. I don't even think they have a model, like in the event that it's discovered that somebody has heavily contributed to another organization's uh, capability or work. I don't even think they have a model to incentivize that um, or yeah. to reward that. So, or to, to, to improve OPRs or, 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 or career, you know, promotion trajectory. It, 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 it doesn't exist. Um, the Air Force, the Air Force doesn't have the same kind of esprit de corps, if you will. Like they don't have, it's, it's not the same. Like if you meet someone who is a Marine or was a Marine, like they are, they are still very much a Marine, you know, they have, they have bought into something where the Air Force I think they have just like these, these exquisite, you know, uh, like technologies they have, they've stovepiped this excellence into, into specific areas and people then instead of being a part of the air force, they're just a part of their smaller group that's in the air force. So they don't really have this broader, uh, devotion to the air force. It's more just, yeah, my group, I'm, I'm down for my group, but maybe not the group's adjacent to my group, you know, which, which is unfortunate. Cause I think, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I think that's what you're kind of getting at is like, we don't even have a way to leverage someone who does have that intrinsic desire to work with other people and to do things beyond the scope of their primary duty. Yeah, um, I think that's right. When I was, when I was, when I joined Microsoft, they were at the start actually of what, what I think most people would describe as, as a transformation. I don't know if you've ever seen like, um, there's like these, these, um, graphics um, that are basically a graph of an organization and trying to represent it. And so there's like one for Google, there's one for Amazon, there's like one for Facebook, um, and there's one for Microsoft. And the one for Microsoft shows large organizations like Windows, Office, Azure, um, and it shows each organization and then it has like guns, like handguns pointed at each other, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and that was the culture under which I, I, I joined Microsoft, right? Uh, where, where basically these organizations were competing for resources and prestige and talent. And, and the way they solved that, they did solve it. Um, the way they solved it was they changed their uh, evaluation criteria for promotion. And so kind of, I was getting at this before, there are three primary criteria that were used to evaluate Microsoft employees that totally changed the game, I think, for them. The first was their individual contributions, which is normal. The second was you were evaluated based on how your individual contribution was leveraged by others. And the third was, how did you leverage others? Notably, two out of three of those are collaborative in nature. Yeah. And um, notably, they were all equal. So if I use somebody else's thing, it's, it's as, it's, it's, it's as valuable as if I had created it. Arguably, it's actually more valuable to the organization because if many people leverage it, well, you've got scaling opportunities there. And it's the same thing if I built something and somebody else, you know, leverages it. Um, so, so when I talk about incentives, those are the incentives that were used to fix kind of this Microsoft problem. And I think that same concept could be applied here, given the similarities I'm seeing between Department of Defense and, and you note that there may be spiritual differences between the organizations. But the truth is, is that these incentives don't exist, even in the Marine Corps, even in, in it, 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 it's not significantly different across service. Um, we still have to follow the same laws and policy. Um, there's small differences, but I don't think it's significant. At OSD, I saw the same problem. Right. Oh yeah. Um, so so and the and the problem is um, you're 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 put in charge of an organization to complete something and 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 you're incentivized to complete that thing, even if even if someone's doing almost the exact same thing. Even if you could 
you could get a 50% head start by leveraging someone else. Um, it's not, it's not, it's just not worth it to them. Uh, and then contractors as well. It's the entire acquisition process as well. If you look at kind of um, contractors, they're paid to complete work. You've described the work they're going to complete. And then if you discover down the line, somebody else already did the same thing or did 50% of the same thing, um, the contractors aren't incentivized to leverage others' work either. Right. Yeah. Because so, all uh, it's going to do is decrease their, yeah. uh, their, you know, contract yeah. profits. And then, and then another male incentive I have to note on data, um, not to jump back to it, but I think it's important is, is, is that, um, today, if you have data and it's, and it's like, um, actually valuable to the department of air force or the department of defense, You'd want to put that into, a, say, an enterprise data storage mechanism. But if it's a lot of data, which likely it would be if it was very valuable, you have to pay. Like your government organization has to pay to store that data in an enterprise data data lake today. By the way, most people call data lakes data. Well, I heard a new term recently. They um, uh, I won't note the organization that said it, but they, they said these aren't data lakes. These are data prisons, which I agree with. Uh, but <laughs> if you want to store your data in an enterprise data lake, you, you, you're you going to have to let, and it's classified data, you're going to have to pay to do that. And nobody's incentivized. Now, now I, 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 there's actually a cost to share my data and collaborate and, and, and make it accessible to others. It's actually a cost on me to do that. We haven't nailed these incentives yet. Yeah. Well, speaking of incentives, so, cause the hackathon is is volunteer, right? I mean, yes. they, they get to come out TDY. So how do you incentivize that? Like, why are they incentivized to, to go to a hackathon to come back to future hackathons? Yeah, I, st I think we're still figuring that out, but here's a few thoughts that come to mind. So number yeah. one, hackathons are really fun. <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah. So, so like they're not fun for everyone I'll know, but they're fun for the people we're trying to attract. Um, and the people we're trying to attract are people who want to build something. And so for those people who want to build something with weapon system data and actually make an impact on the way we fight war, um, this is, we tried to make it like Nirvana, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> like, like, like not a better place in the department of defense to go build stuff with weapon system data. You won't find a better place. I don't, I assert anywhere. And we're increasingly designing it to do that. Um, nice. So we're enabling these sorts of people who want to develop stuff. Um, so number one, it's a lot of fun for those who attend. And we see it all the time. And we see the feedback from that all the time and the excitement around that. Number one. Number two, um, the second incentive is that many of our participants are in fact compensated to participate. So if you're DO, if you're a DOD employee, you're still getting your salary. Uh, if you're, if you're um, a contractor participating, so that's the second way you can participate is as a contractor with, with approval from your contract officer, um, then you're being paid to do it. So um, a minority of people participate through industry. And if you participate through our, our uh, through CyberWorks where you apply, who has notably a partnership intermediary agreement, we cannot pay you for the work, um, but but you can you can still participate. And we we constantly both t both hackathons we have totally filled our cap and gone above it. Like we have excess demand to go work for free and show up to a hackathon <laughs> from companies. That's awesome. And 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 so maybe that will run out. Maybe, but I don't think it will. And and the feedback we get from some companies. Um, cause like the fact is these companies, what are we trading? What's happening? So our event produces a need to know. I have a, you have a need to know if you're accepted to our event to participate with those data. There is no way you can participate in our event without those data. And those data are, we attempt to obtain the most interesting data in the air force. All right. So yeah. that, that participation that's kind of the trade. The trade is um, we've we've confirmed your need to know. We've confirmed your your clearance, whatever it is. See, you, it could be unclass or it could be um, secret or higher uh, for our event. But we've can you know, and you get to participate and see and work with people, subject matter experts, DoD employees, um, and 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 that's valuable. 
right? I, I would I would say kind of a, a sub point to this is that many companies show up to like a conference. I call them kind of talking conferences now because they're they're basically talking. You're like you just talk at them, yeah. right? You don't build anything at them. We're we're kind of like a building conference. They're a talking conference. So you show up to a talking conference and 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 you know there are people talking in the main hall and then there's like this demo area where each company is segmented out and they've produced this demonstration with no data. They can't have real data because it's not a classified event or area. Nobody's produced a, an, an authority to operate. Nobody's giving them, they don't have the need to know to the data. So they, they're, they're working with fake data and they have this like, you know, whatever demonstration of their product with no data, no real use case. Um, and, and then people walk around and try to look at it and try to squint and see how it could apply to the Department of Defense. I don't think that's a better way to learn about DOD's problems. And even if I'm an industry to market my skill set, the best way to market your skill set is going to be to show someone you can build something on a real problem with real data. So we have, yeah. we have excessive demand from industry industry. There, there are some who cannot spare it. I, I note that, that small companies may not be able to spare it. We, we, we appreciate that. Um, we hope that they get a contract and they participate through that avenue, but but this is a big opportunity for industry to learn from us and to learn from our challenge set and also to meet senior leaders and DOD employees who have specialization in this, in, in, in whatever the problem set is. And, and industry benefits tremendously from that. The third benefit for anybody who participates is learning. So you're able to try new technologies, try new software, learn about new data and use cases. There's just, you just let serendipity happen. <laughs> right. And, 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 yeah. and at DOD, we're horrible at that. We don't even, that's not a, th I don't know that serendipity is part of even our, 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 our process, but at, at, at tech companies, it is. So, um, at tech companies, serendipity hackathons are a normal thing. And, and, and that results in usually so, a, a, a new thought that you bring to production quickly at an event. Uh, I'm trying to think what other, what other incentives may exist. So the final incentive is senior leadership, um, senior leadership attention. So I think that that attention is valuable, right? That's hard to get. Um, most senior leaders are really busy uh, and and don't have the bandwidth or may not even respond to an email with an idea. And so in this case, we've like time boxed a period of time where they're going to show up and they're going to see all the ideas. And nobody knows what's going to happen after they see that. But they may, at least if our organization has been structured correctly, which I'm not sure it has been, they may <laughs> be able to influence or positively impact the outcome of that project, i.e. it may be able to continue in some form by their presence, seeing it, and by their ability to make things happen. And so if you show them something great, the hope is – our organization and the structure won't stop that thing from landing somewhere. Um, and so that incentives, that's a big incentive because if you do something great for the Air Force, hopefully again, the incentives exist that we would reward someone for producing those things, right? So yeah. anyways, those I think are some compelling reasons why we get, we've gotten now significant attendance at our events and um, people, people have, have expressed interest in returning and continuing to help with this effort. Nice. I have, I have two questions on that. One of yeah. them is, so obviously you get the need to know from going to the thing, but if you don't already have the requisite security clearance, then can you still attend? And then two, uh, who, who are you looking to, to show up? Obviously people that can program, but like a guy with experience in operations, but not a computer programmer? Like who, who are you looking for? Who do you get yeah. uh, arriving at these? Okay, so to your Clarence question, today we do not clear people um, up to something higher than they're currently at. Uh, and so, but we did have a CUI level hackathon, which was on class. And anybody would, actually any American citizen was eligible to apply and participate at that hackathon. Um, if accepted, right? And so um, we don't accept anybody. These are competitive things. But but um, if 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 
if you you have some skills that would be valuable, many people do, then then we 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 try to accept them. Um, the other thing to note on that is is there's limitations of space, and so our, our our acceptance is based on the limitations of space. So today we're not clearing people. That's something we've talked about. I'll leave it there for now. Um, so number <laughs> two, what was that? Oh, you're hoping in the future to maybe alleviate that. Would you say that's accurate? It would be, it, I think it is a vital national interest to be able to clear those with expertise to build things during war or during potential lead up to conflict, that those, that the expertise is able, to, is accessed to the data necessary to build. And if they have demonstrated that expertise and we have the ability to assess their, their kind of their, their risk and and we've determined that that risk is is lower than the benefit that they could potentially build then we have the ability to clear them and uh, those people likely may not be or, or often are not um, in say an application process or accepted into a position at the Department of Defense where 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 they would have then started that clearance process but if their attendance at these events results in contributions, then yes, I think that they that there is a there is a a a, a what they call the word the words are need to know. There, if they've demonstrated yeah. expertise and the ability the ability to positively impact national security, um, I as a senior leader assess that they have a need to know, um, and 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 those data owners would need to assess the same in order to clear them to those data. But but um, yes, I think that there's a need to know if they can positively in impact national security why not now to your to your second question what are we looking for we're looking for builders now we've started to think about we we, we at our first event we had just one category we were, we were basically a hacker and then we didn't really have this official designation it was like basically organizers and organizer supporters and it's turned into for for our second hackathon um we had applications open for those who are hackers or supporters and supporters do things like get the coffee, get the food, um, register people, uh, help them, help them, you know, book their flight if their flight gets delayed or whatever, or rebook their flight. Help them, help them with anything. Uh, also, not anything, but help them with whatever is legally allowed, right? Um, <laughs> and 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 also um, uh, to to help with security. So uh, we need physical presence. We need some. Basically, we need people to babysit the, the security apparatus, so they have to go do that. So some people are, you know, hanging out late at night. Uh, maybe there's not many people there, and and they're 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 there to make sure that the the event continues to run. Um, so we've got supporters, hackers. For our th next event, we expect to add a third category called SMEs or subject matter experts, and so. Um, we think that those are the three ways people can participate. For those who are hackers, which I think was the heart of your question, um, today, hackers tend to be data engineers, data scientists, product managers, software developers, front-end developers, data visualization engineers, user experience experts. Um, but we also want you know, those who are inclined to perform those roles with expertise in the data and problem set itself. So problem or, su problem or subject matter experts can build. And it is completely normal at a hackathon for people on a team not all to be on the keyboard. And they might just be hanging out, watching other people work, answering maybe 20 questions in a day. And that's okay. There are people who are responsible for pitching the idea. How do you make it stick with senior leaders? We need people who can do that. Um, we need people who have expertise into the data um, or into the weapon system or who can imagine new use cases or ways to scale it. Those are all non-technical roles, right? Yeah. Uh, and so, what, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, and that's, and that's great because as someone who, who loves the idea and loves innovation and thinks it's cool, you know, I could be a really good coffee guy. I guarantee that, you know, I'll, yeah, yeah. I'll do all the coffee runs and get all the stuff, but it, it's good that it's, it's more than just people who are really good at computers and programming and that you can, you can do your part 
and and help enable these things even though this isn't your space is as long as you have you know the requisite like classification and stuff like that so fact, that's good to hear in fact the best teams we're finding regularly the best teams that are selected have expertise though those are the teams that win just to be oh, just yeah. to be clear if you if you are just a tech team you do not you 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 generally are less you're far less likely to to win the most awards or or or, or win frankly um any awards because um you probably aren't going to capture the use case so we we've we've not only it was not only a hypothesis but we it's proved out there's now evidence to support that that if you don't have someone with subject matter expertise on your team your team is far more likely to be less successful now why do we still emphasize the hackers, the technical hackers, because all of those teams that won, there's, there's, there, while I have, I, I've, I've made the argument that, that it is, it is a, it is, it is extraordinarily likely that you will need somebody with subject matter expertise um, to perform. All of those teams that won possess someone who is technical. Yeah. At least one, more often than not, many or a majority. Yeah. So it remains the case that you need a technical, you need tech, uh, tech, like hard technical skills on the team to win, but and to produce something of value. But that team without a SME is not likely to succeed. So yeah. we need and it makes, yeah, and it's 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 funny when I, when I was younger, I thought you know all I want to do is, is get tactical and fly airplanes and go fast and drop bombs and all that cool stuff. And it's cool. But what you find out is, is these tactical problems that you find in the airplane. They're, they're everywhere. They're, they're in hackathons. They're all over the place. They're with the data from the flight of my, my dropping bombs. So it, it's wonderful. And the, the, a guy, both of us know Tron, uh, Bloom. I talk about him often on the, the podcast cause we're good buddies. Uh, but he, he's attended a hackathon. He loves them. And, uh, but he being a computer science, uh, guy and you know, me being his friend, uh, we have a lot of conversations, uh, that, that kind of dive into that and, and the nature of writing programs and, and truly understand, understanding problem sets. And that's what I love because, in the in the F sixteen or in flying fighters, you try to boil things down and 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 really understand the root cause and the base of things, and that's exactly what you're doing when you're trying to write a program for something or understand something to to make change in the you know a software or program space. Uh, so it's it's just so cool. It's a it's a very exciting uh, industry and organization. So I, I appreciate that you're doing it, and uh, and it's awesome. So uh, one question I had, uh, well, actually I have a lot of questions, but the, the next one in the hopper for questions. Uh, so if, if you kind of had the ability to make any sort of change, and we kind of hit on this a little bit before, but to the way we use data, the way we store data to kind of make us competitive in like a near peer or a future fight, what would that look like? Like if you were in control, what would, what would you do? Okay, so we talked about the malincentive for storage of data. So number yeah. one, I think there needs to be, and there, there needs we need to we need to flip we need to flip the incentives for data sharing. So number one, it needs to be the case that um, if you're withholding data from the enterprise, there's actually a penalty. Penalty. So flip the incentive, right? Yeah. Um, if you're not sharing, there's a penalty. And, 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 and there may be certain programs that have reason to not share. So that should, that should, that, that, that should result in deeper analysis. Um, I actually imagine a graph where um, you're able, where edges represent organizations that share. So nodes represent organizations and edges represent, um, and this would be directional, um, Edges would represent data that's flowing or being shared to other organizations or being leveraged by other organizations. And this would be kind of like a process chart. What this would tell me is who's sharing with who, right? And who's using those data, who's, who's sending, who's receiving, right? I'd be yeah. very interested to know who's sending. Those are the most important parts of our organization if we're to build a data-driven enterprise. 
I'd be interested to know who's receiving. Those people are leveraging those data, though they might be kind of holes where they just receive and don't send. Depends on their mission, but you know, it starts to tell a story. But who I'd be most interested in would be the islands. Those who aren't sending and those who aren't leveraging. And yeah. um, unless unless they have good reason to be doing that, they probably don't need to exist. That would be where I would actually seek to reclaim resources. And so number one, that would be those those that's how you can actually turn what I just said, the incentives and malincentives into actually a data-driven process where you go, who's sharing data, who's receiving data, how much of it, what are they using it for? We can start to map those quantitative and qualitative uh, analysis. And then we can start to ask the questions, what are the organizations that aren't doing anything with anybody else, right? Um, so number one. Number two, let's talk about um, risk. So I think DOD um, talks a ton about risk, gets risk management totally wrong. Totally wrong. Um, so especially in the cyber, the cyber world. So if you if you work in cyber at the DOD, your incentive is to stop vulnerabilities. You do not want to get hacked. You recognize there's a mission, but your primary mission, don't get hacked. Don't have a spill. Don't have a data spill. Don't get hacked. Don't let anything bad happen in the organization. And you are reducing risk by doing that. And you will take the dial and you will turn it like the, whatever that dial is, or I think of like a volume knob, you will turn the volume to the highest amount to reduce risk to side. Because, because if you get hacked, you might lose your job. It's going to reflect negatively on you. Right. And, and, yeah. and, and so you're going to do everything in your control to mitigate risk. And so you think about risk, you talk about risk all the time. And the only risk you're talking about is spills and cyber attacks. And the risk you're not talking about is the adversary building capability faster than us. That's not a risk on your plate. That's not a risk that you get yelled at for. That's not a risk that you get fired for. So um, so I think cyber assessors assess um, the risk of vulnerability. They, they hyper-focus on that. They almost blind themselves to that other risk I just described, the risk of going too slow the risk of an adversary building faster than us. It's likely the case that if the adversary has better capability than us in a certain area, we don't need to be hyper-focused on the risk, the cyber risk of that, of that system. If they've got something better, they're not trying, they're not, what's stealing it, stealing from us going to do? Yeah, it's not helping them. It's not going to yeah. help them very much. Um, sure, there is still some cyber risk. There's not none, but the, the, uh, the, the evaluation should change based on our expectations or knowledge of adversary capabilities and our mission needs to go faster. And today, that does not play a role in the cyber risk assessment. That is not required to play a role in the cyber risk assessment, which means it's not part, for the most part, with exception to a few authorization officials I know, it is basically not a part of the assessment. Um, yeah, and I'm go oh, ahead. As speak, speaking as the uh, pink body in the airplane, you know, it's a, it is in my best interest to have the most advanced tactics, the most advanced technology, the most, you know, advanced everything. Uh, so I, I mean, I appreciate that because that's exactly what, what I want to happen. I want to, I want to outperform the adversary in every way, shape and form. And the sad, the problem is we've had such a, advantage over every adversary for so long people almost probably just got caught on their heels of like hey we we always have better stuff than them and it's like i don't i don't know if that's still the case you know it's like people are moving fast these days and sadly we are not one of those people moving fast well right so if you look at it from a cultural perspective we're hoarding we're hoarding capability and it, it, it feels like we're grabbing we're like holding as tight as possible to the capability we have. Then we're like looking over our shoulder going like, please don't, don't go faster than us. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and that's what, that's, that's the result of what we have today. We're just, yeah. we're, we're, we're hoarding and protecting information. You know, companies that acted like that. I think of a company that comes to mind in the industry that acted like that blockbuster. <laughs> blockbuster is a company that acted just like that. They, they held on 
to their old process. They sought to protect their existing business model, and they literally couldn't even see that there was change in the environment. That's yeah. the type of organization we are right now. That's what I think. Um, yeah. And 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 um, so 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 that's that's one pro that's one piece of this problem. The other piece, though, that's really important is data. So this is again another cyber assessment. So there's this risk that exists that if that it's possible by aggregating data, it's called it's known as the mosaic effect, um, and and basically, um, what it says. Have you heard of this before? Uh, I mean, I've heard people use the term like the mosaic of information and stuff, but I I don't know mosaic if it's exactly effect. the same. So the idea is yeah. that. If you produce a mosaic with it with data, if you basically if you aggregate data at a certain classification level, say the unclass level, you might learn something that's extremely more classified. So, uh, an example I used to give before the pandemic, I still I guess give it after the pandemic, but it's kind of different now. But if I if I told you that like it, it might be the case that it's unclassified and releasable that one person at say Beale Air Force Base has the flu, and that that tells you. Basically nothing. A person yeah. on the base has the flu. But if you then aggregated those results, if you actually had access to every single person who had the flu at Beale Air Force Base and you learned that 80% of the base had the flu, that's not unclassified information anymore. Right? Yeah. That tells you something very serious about the readiness of that base. Okay? Yeah. This is the mosaic effect. So you learn something by aggregating data that results in a classification discovery that's at a higher classification than the information system you are on. And if you, if, and so, and so basically cyber assessors ask the question, what could you possibly learn? And then if it's anything of classified origin, you are immediately not allowed to do it. Okay. You're immediately, yeah. so any, any joining of data, is scary to them um, because you might learn something and they might, they, they don't even know what you might learn and they stop it. And I experienced this when I was at OSD. And so this, again, this inhibits the ability to build stuff. I, 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 I there's no other way to describe, like you cannot build stuff if, it with and build data driven capabilities. If you can't join data together and the obsession over this it's an obsession, by the way, um, that that our trusted people who are cleared to secret might learn something higher. I got it. Like that's that's a risk, but like these are trusted people. They, you know, at, at a classification level, you know, and 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 we're concerned that they might learn something that could be too high. Meanwhile, if our adversary steals this data, they're going to learn more than we ever could on it because we're not yeah. allowed to join the data together. <laughs> Yeah, this is, our this adversaries is, will, though. Right. And so this, again, is this concept of, like, hoarding and being being afraid of, of – we're afraid of our own selves and, yeah. and what we might learn from our data. And and if we want to transform to a, to a data-driven organization, we're going to need to figure that out. And, and, and I don't think right now – we don't have the horsepower working on that problem to figure that out. It doesn't feel like we do today. And it doesn't feel like we, that is a technical problem requiring technical expertise. Um, and I'm, I'm frankly concerned that, that, that today we still do not have the ability to produce data-driven capabilities from our existing data, not because the technology doesn't exist, not because we don't have the expertise, but because cyber assessment um, assesses the risk of learning to be higher than the risk of not building, the risk of going too slow. Which, you know, I always wonder who, how are they so uninterested about losing the fight? You know, how are they so much more hyper-focused on spillage versus, hey, we are going to get outpaced and we are not going to be prepared to handle the next war. Uh, I mean, is it just because they are, they're so focused and they're, they're just in their bubble because we don't communicate communicate across organizations that they don't understand the severity of the limitation that they're creating? Many cyber assessors are non-technical. And so they don't, I, I, I don't actually think they understand the range of the problem. I don't think they understand the implications of their decisions. And also, I mean, like 
the 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 consequences of this I can see is I protected our 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 weapon systems and succeeded even though we lost the lower. Right. <laughs> Like that's, Which that's, doesn't, that's what doesn't this, do much. that's what this translates to. That's what yeah, this translates gosh. to. Or during war, basically at some point when people start, like when we start losing human lives because of this, then I guess the point is made and potentially the policies or the interpretation of the policies starts shifting. But today this hasn't broken through yet. Yeah. And I think sadly, you know, just kind of on the operational side, there there was a period of time where it was it was definitely like a, a a big performance gap and a technological gap between you know each side. And nowadays, a lot of it is you got to just do some of that pilot stuff and just be an athlete about it. And it's just it's unfortunate because the reality is, like you said, like we I think this capability has existed, or we could have been using and leveraging this for probably decades now. Uh, and the fact that we are, we're finally just scratching the surface cause it doesn't even seem like we're implementing. We're just scratching the surface on the utility of this is, uh, is unfortunate. One, uh, one other question I had was, so I, we talked about incentive structures and we have military members who are, who are just internally motivated to do these things. And they're sitting in their squadrons and they say, man, I could, write a program to fix this. But what they run into is they have nipper computers that they can't with all the data that they can't program on, but then they have home computers with no data and they can program. Like, is there any way to let people on an individual basis around the air force who have this capability actually leverage their own ability in their squadron to, to do better? So there's a challenge here. And the challenge is the production systems and authorization of the production systems costs money. And generally, contractors or organizations on contract are resourced to build capability and then to have that capability uh, reviewed and assessed by cyber assessors, um, any libraries that are used, it's assessed, etc. And they've invested They've, they've intentionally in their contract written that in so that they have someone to go do that. And the problem is, is that if you're a DOD employee, that doesn't exist for you. Uh, they've also um, invested into a development environment. Your home computer is your development environment, right? There is no other real yeah. development environment. Now, there are, um, DOD would say, uh, and Air Force would say that there are nipper development environments. And those environments might be like Advana, where I used to work um, and run development and engineering there. Or it might be Vault or, or uh, Envision, uh, Elixir, all sorts of different data platforms that exist at the DoD. Those are all production data platforms that allow you to they actually do provide some tooling. And, and companies have sold those tools to the government uh, that are on contract, and, and you can use those tools. The problem, of course, is that if those tools do not satisfy you, or if there's yeah. a new algorithm or a new library on the internet that, that you'd like to get added, now you have to run through the process to get it added. And how do you even know that it's going to f perform the thing that you want with the data you have without trying it? Well, you can't try it because it's not approved in the production environment, right? <laughs> the production environment is production. Um, yeah. And so what we've done is we basically have this bolt-on solution where we offer a baby development environment from, from purchased or trusted um, contractors who are trying to do good work, right? But it's in this environment tied to production data. And the only thing that's allowed to run there is something that's approved. And so how do you, how do you get past that chicken and egg problem? Um, the DOD has not resourced it yet, in my opinion. There's a few, there's a few development environments exist. Uh, that, that that exists, but they're not really considered enterprise development environments. They're not necessarily designed to solve this problem in full, and they don't have a pathway, a clear pathway to go from development environment to production. So our 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 hackathons are trying to kind of incentivize the offering of this environment. What you've asked for is exactly what the Department of Defense needs to do serious innovation. Uh, we ask we ask our we ask our employees 
We ask uh, our military members to go and study data science, right? That's a big thing right now, or engineering or software engineering or, 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 or data visualization or whatnot. And they learn with tools, open source free tools that are leverageable by the Department of Defense if only they were authorized, right? But they're not authorized. Yeah. Many of them are not. <laughs> many, many. And so um, it's, a, it's a clear and obvious gap to me. And, 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 and I'm hoping to try to find the resources to solve it. Well, I, I hope you do, because I think that is, it, it, we need to do it. We have to do it. You know, we can't, we can't say, ah, oh, we gave it a shot and it, it doesn't work. What would you say? So if, if the half hackathon takes off and because it becomes everything you want it to be, what is your end state for it? What do you envision that looking like yeah. uh, when it finally gets to the end? Yeah. And sorry to answer the last piece of your question. You can, oh. you can, if you have access to the, to a stitches development environment or stitches instance um, and stitches is now an air force program. Uh, it exists in, in multiple locations at multiple bases within the air force. That is a place where, cause that is the, it, the uh, IT system we use for our hackathons. So that is a place where okay. you could where you could do some do what I'm describing, right? So that it does exist today, but it's limited in funding, limited in availability, and not yet enterprise. But I'm I'm hoping that changes soon. Um, and sorry, what was the the last question or the the? Oh the yeah. Origin? Well, before I get to that, one thing because you know Spark Cells, right? Spark Cells yeah. are a base run effectively innovation hubs. I wonder if they could integrate stitches into the spark cells. Uh, but that's, that's kind of outside looking in, but the question I had was, it could if the, if the, yeah, if the hackathon takes off yes. and, and you are able to, able to implement it in, in perpetuity, create yes. an organization around it, what would that look like? And what would you hope uh, for it to do? Yeah. So I think ideally, uh, there's so many there's so many ways this is leverageable because it's a time boxed event. So the so the hackathon is is not supposed to be. There's no tech behind what we're doing. We're integrating tech. That's all we're doing. I don't want to invent anything. I don't want any new technology. I don't want a new data platform to rule it all. I don't want a new software platform to rule it all. I'm not. I'm not. I'm. I, there's nothing. There's nothing to the hackathon that's that's tech, technology. It's just an event with people gathering together, looking at data and trying to build stuff quickly. So what I'd like to do, what does that look like at the nth degree? So it looks like the following. We run data-driven exercises with existing technologies within the Department of Defense. Um, we're able to find a way through, uh, we didn't even talk about um, the 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 risks, the risks of, of, of conflicts of interest and others uh, by oh, yeah. working with industry and whatnot, but we're able to integrate everybody who wants to participate in building capability for the Department of Defense, regardless if you have a defense contract or not. We're able to learn about um, who, who can contribute and quickly contribute to the fight and run data-driven exercises that push the limit of our technologies and the integration of them. And, uh, and, and those would be designed, thoroughly designed around um, warfighter needs, um, major command needs, and, and also notably other military departments, as well as joint partners, um, meaning, meaning foreign partners. So data-driven exercises, literally exercises. You guys conduct exercises where you fly weapon systems. I'm not, I'm not knowledgeable. I don't claim to be knowledgeable about those things, but, <laughs> but but likely, instead of designing those exercises just around um, just around utilizing the weapon system itself, we would run exercises designed around collection of the data from those weapon systems and leveraging those data to fight better. And 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 so and so a hackathon would actually entail the hardware. Uh, we imagine doing doing stuff like like collecting with the with with the weapon systems and immediately getting the data. Um, we imagine hackers trying different things to disrupt those systems intentionally, acting as kind of a white hat. Um, we imagine testing resiliency. Could we unplug certain systems? Could we assume in a fight that that you know I think it's reasonable to assume in a fight that that 
we're, we're not going to lose nothing. So what are we most likely to lose? Could we start unplugging those things and, and, and then, and then building more resilient systems, testing and measuring those systems and then building more resilient systems. And so those are all potential, you know, things on the table for, for future events where, where we prepare, we prepare to, to, to basically, um, surge expertise in data, software, hardware, et cetera, um, in a fight. That's what we're trying to do. That's awesome. I think, I think you should definitely do that. You know, if you get around to it, <laughs> the, we'll uh, yeah, the one thing that again, you know, standard fighter pilot, I think about flying planes all the time. Uh, have you, you've heard of like red flag or orange flag or black flag. So is there any idea of just integrating or running parallel to like, Hey, we've got all these jets going and fighting is the most advanced fight we can have. Uh, and then we're just going to real time, see what we can do. Yeah. So I think I, I would, I, I, so, so in short, um, the data from those exercises are very interesting. So, yeah. um, yeah, I think, I think that's the, the, the challenge here is the, the conversation and or transformation. So I'm totally cool with that, but, um, the nerds have to be able to take the stick. So, um, it, 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 it what I mean by that is that those events are designed to exercise certain capabilities, oftentimes not um, led by engineers, data scientists, et cetera, who are thinking about problems that are a little bit different. Um, and I'm not minimizing what they're doing. I think what they're doing is excellent um, and it needs to continue. The question is, is can, 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 can the nerds take the stick? And either increase basically the extent to which we we design these exercises around data and software, or do we need something else? And uh, um, I'm not. It's not. It's not meant to. It's 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 with maximum respect to what they're doing and the benefits that those exercises have produced. Many of which I don't even know, likely. But I think those exercises have probably been extraordinarily successful in producing the tactics and the weapon systems we leverage. The question is, 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 does this start out by working within those, those existing systems of which they have designed processes, right? Or, yeah. or do we do something else? I don't personally have a strong opinion. I just want to run data driven exercises, um, that are dominated by, by those who believe that, that, the future of fight may be, may, may be oriented increasingly towards decision-making um, made by or informed deeply by um, machine and data-driven process. And, and I don't know how that lands or how that ends up, but, but, um, but it probably needs more nerds on the stick right now. No, I respect that. I mean, there's, there's amazing stuff that, that is happening out there and that can happen for from exactly that. And there's, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on out there that I think would fit exactly in with that. You know, like, like you said, red flag is very much like operator focused, uh, right. but orange flag, black flag, Northern edge, like these are things that are, that are not operator focused. They're very much like data focused. Uh, yeah. so maybe, maybe it'll work. I hope, I hope it does because I think that would probably be a, a wealth of knowledge and a really exciting or I interesting, uh, thing to work on. Well, uh, Stuart, before I let you go, any last, uh, parting shots for, uh, for the audience or anything we haven't got to talk about that you want to talk about? No, I think, I think we covered the stuff I wanted to, to touch on. I appreciated the questions and the conversation. Yeah, this was great. I, uh, maybe someday I'll be able to come visit a hackathon or, uh, uh, you know, or maybe get you out to see some jets or squadrons or something, but, uh, cool. well, sweet. Well, how does everybody uh, get in contact with you, with you? Uh, I think the best way would be to to add me on LinkedIn and feel free to send me a message. Um, my email box is is pretty tapped out, but if you're on if you're an Air Force if you're in if you're in the Air Force or in the DoD, you can look me up and send me an email if you want. Um, but but the best way to reach me would be Stuart Wagner on on LinkedIn for for most of this external audience. 
Awesome. Well, sweet. Well, yeah. And, uh, everybody, uh, as always, uh, contact me at, uh, Vader at Kodiak If you have any inputs on uh, good, bad, or otherwise. And then if you want to be on the show, obviously email at us at uh, Vader at Kodiak shack.com. Check out our website, Vader or uh, Kodiak shack.com. I do that every time. Uh, but Stuart, thanks again for coming on the show. And, uh, and I appreciate you taking the time and all the, the hard work you're doing. Thank you. Thanks Vader. Have a good afternoon. Yep, bye.